let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd just like to have a short word of prayer, and then after that, make an announcement, and then we'll go after some of these questions, hopefully all of them. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your love to us. Thank you for a wonderful lunch and for wonderful fellowship. And we, we pray for the Holy Spirit to guide us, direct our minds so that we will accept nothing but that which we can see in inspiration. Strengthen each one of us and bless our time as we have this Q&A right now, we pray. Just a brief comment before we get to the questions. Uh, there was a reason why we had questions written down on paper. I have been in Q&As in uh, various places where sometimes a Q&A is misunderstood as a preaching service. And the preaching service is not done up here, but it actually is done down there. And that's not the point of the Q&A. Uh, nor is the purpose of the Q&A to, if you've asked a question and the answer I give is one that you don't agree with or you don't like and you want to argue with me. I'm not here to argue with you. So, uh, and I'm sure there's nobody here that would argue anyway. However, I feel it's necessary to make that clear. And if you don't like the response I give, uh, I won't be offended and I won't be upset. And if you want to discuss it afterwards, I'd be very happy to do that with you. Okay? So, I will simply read the question, give you the best answer I can, either from the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, history, or just plain logic and reason. Okay? And um, there won't be any questions from the audience because there are plenty of questions here and we're looking at a time element, so uh, without further ado, here we go. What is the most important message that we need to give to the world as Seventh-day Adventists? Number one, I appreciate uh, whoever wrote this, that that is where our message is to go. It's to go to the world. Uh, it's not to go to other Adventists. While we can reach out to them, that's not to be our focal point. It is to be to the world. Um, what is our message? Well, I believe that's found in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. The three angels' messages, those are our messages. Um, of course, those include the sanctuary, the law of God, the health message, the fact that the other churches are in apostasy, and that the papacy has set up a spurious or false Sabbath. And within all of those messages, the hub and sum and substance of them is mankind's absolute need for the power of Christ in our lives. We would call that righteousness by faith. Okay? Those are our messages. After the mass saturation coverage concerning the new pope, why has the papacy gone so quiet? Well, that, you know, everybody has, these are, these, this is a good question too. Uh, some of them I'm just going to tell you, uh, I could give you an educated guess, and that's about all it's going to be. Uh, why are they quiet? Well, whenever a new pope comes in, they always have all the hoopla and tell us what a great, wonderful, and kind man he is. Um, and then after that, they get to work. 
I, I will say this, Francis the I uh, is the first Jesuit pope since the founding of the Jesuit order back um, 450 years ago. Um, all the press told us that he was a wonderful, kind, humble, servant man. Folk, make no mistake, he is a cold-blooded killer. He is a Jesuit. He took an oath that his sole purpose in being a Jesuit was to destroy Protestantism. And if that meant killing, maiming, uh, pulling out, uh, you know, pregnant women, destroying their babies, whatever he had to do, Francis I agreed to that oath that he would be a destroyer of Protestants and the Protestant Reformation. So everything you heard about him being a wonderful, humble, servant, kind, loving man was an absolute and total lie. Okay? Now I hope you didn't believe it because the BBC or, or you know some station in America said because they were lying to you. Okay? The fact that there are two, now two white popes living, which is Francis I and uh, Benedict XVI, which has never happened in the history of the Vatican, and also two black popes, I believe, friends, that they know as well as their master knows that God is about to do something miraculous in this world. And so the devil is going to put his best at headquarters to plan every attempt that they can to destroy Protestantism, the work of God in this world, and to stop the latter reign. That's why I believe there's four of them there now. What do they have in store for the United States? Well, what they have in store for the United States, they're doing in the United States, and they've been doing it for oh, over the last hundred years. That is to, number one, have a dominating and absolutely all-controlling central bank that controls the flow of money in the country because they believe in the golden rule. The one who has the gold makes the rules. So they've done that. They've created war, which they are doing in America, and they're doing it around the world, and using America as their uh, bully. America is the world's bully today, let's face it. America is all over this earth, and I don't know how closely behind them England is, but I know America is, is the world's bully. And America is fighting wars all over the world today for Rome. Because Rome is dead set on regaining control of this planet. Uh, so, what does the Vatican have planned now for America into the near future? I'm sure more wars. I'm sure more terrorism. I'm sure uh, it's very possible an economic crisis. Um, and possibly terrorism that will bring in a Sunday law. What is the time period between the passing of the National Sunday Law to the Second Coming of Christ? We have absolutely no light on that whatsoever. For those amongst us today that want to take the prophecies of Daniel chapter 12 and apply them to the future, they are dead wrong. Dead wrong. The prophecies of Daniel 12 are to be interpreted just as the time prophecies in Daniel 7, Daniel 8, and Daniel 9. The, the biblical principle in prophecy, time prophecy is a day equals a year. So we have absolutely no light as to how much time exists between the Sunday law and the second coming of Christ. What do you think of Walter Weiss saying that people should stay in the church in his series, Total Transformation? 
Why does he want people to stay in the church when there is so much apostasy? Well, in all, fa in all fairness to Dr. Veith, I believe his total onslaught series, his rekindling the Reformation, his repairing the breach, are some of the most wonderful DVDs that have been put out in the last how many years in Seventh-day Adventism. Those DVDs are tremendous. So I believe that he has been used of heaven to give those messages. To the one that you asked in that paper right there, I think it's an absolute abomination for that man with all the knowledge and all of the study he has done to say something so irrational and illogical as to tell people that they are to take glue, squirt the pew, sit there, and listen to somebody give you false teaching. The reason I say that is because the Bible says that false doctrine, the Bible refers to it as wine. Revelation 14, 8, Revelation 17, 2. Why? The wine of Babylon. That's what false doctrine is called. Well, folks, let me tell you. If somebody sits in a church and Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath are listening to false doctrine, they're drinking wine. That's what the Bible says. They're drinking wine. Now, what happens if you drink enough wine? What happens to you? You get drunk? How much thinking goes on when you're drunk? None. You can't think anymore. You can't think. You become numb, desensitized. And if you're listening to apostate teaching, Sabbath after Sabbath after Sabbath, and you are not standing up and protesting, you're becoming drunk. And Walter Weiss, and in all respect to the other work that he has done, for him to tell people to stay in and imbibe false teaching to drink wine is an abomination. When you... Oh. <laughs> oh, this is one of those. <laughs> is that random? I see that's good. <laughs> it says, when are you coming again? I'm not going to say who, who wrote this one. Amen. That, that Jenna quit talking so loud, people might think you wrote it. <laughs> she said, um, God bless you and your family. Pray for me and my family too. We pray for you and your family. I pray for our group. Thank you. Um, Jenna, that's really sweet. That was not me. I said to do that, but I didn't. It was not me. Oh, did I misread that name? It sure looks like. Maybe it's by Mia. Mia. Oh, it's says Mia. Mia. Okay, maybe I need to put on my glasses, but that M sure looks like a J. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Um, Nina, I, I hope, um, you know, of course I need to get back home, and uh, I have other trips, but um, I would love to return. Um, it's, I've had a wonderful time here. You know, Sonny, Belinda, uh, Anasha, and of course the... The folks here, Michael, Maria, yeah. Jenna, you know, I just, I've been treated very nicely and I love coming here. So if it works out, Nina, I'd love to come back. Love to come back. Let's see, what was your reason for writing your two books? Well, the first book I wrote was um, right after September 11th. I was before September 11th. I was doing a series in my church called Behind the Door, and uh, which I had coined from 
a video I had watched many years ago that was done by James Arabito. And I felt it was a powerful video. And, uh, and I started studying. Of course, I've gathered books over the years from many people at meetings that walk up to me and hand me a book on Catholicism and slavery, uh, the Washington, Moscow, Washington Alliance, Vietnam, why did we go, 50 years in the Church of Rome, and on and on and on and on. And I was studying those. I was doing a series in my church on the Jesuit order in history, current events, and prophecy. And um, September 11th happened, and that day that it happened, I looked into my television set, and I said, as I watched the airplanes go into the buildings on Rewind, I said, they're going to now demand that America give up their liberties. Rome is going to demand it. And I yelled right into my television. And I was very angry at what I was watching on September 11, 2001, because I had that series going on in my church. And I knew how Rome had worked in the past to destroy liberty in countries throughout the world. Well, that evening I listened as George Stephanopoulos, a right-hand man of Bill Clinton, turned to Peter Jennings, the host of ABC News at that time, and he said, Peter Jennings said, well, George, what does America have to do in order to feel safe? George Stephanopoulos, it was like they had rehearsed that question all day long. George Stephanopoulos didn't miss a beat, and he said, America needs to surrender their freedom. And I looked into the mirror, and I said, and you are a Jesuit coadjutor. And um, I continued to do the series in my church. I went out to Loma Linda, California, gave some talks on the Jesuits in history and current events in world affairs. And when I got done, about three or four people walked up to me and said, Bill, the world needs to hear this. And um, I said, well, you know, there's all kinds of people that can do that. I mean, there's people like Mark Finley and Doug Batchelor and, and all these other highfalutin, I mean, people that are well known. I wasn't well known. And, and uh, they said, no, Bill, you need to tell the world this. And I said, will you pray for me? <coughs> and uh, then a week later, I was at home, and a gentleman called me from Tennessee. And he said, I just listened to your programs from Loma Linda. And I said, sir, you live where? He said, Tennessee. I said, so how did you get him? He said, I had a friend who was in the church that Sabbath. And uh, he said, Sir, I am from Communist China. The leaders of Communist China need to know who is trying to destroy China from the inside out. And you are the person that needs to write a book to warn them. And I got off the phone and I started thinking, that's what the people in Loma Linda said. And now this guy who was from China said that? And a conviction came to me that what I was sharing in my church was good, but it had to go beyond the church walls. And um, that was why I wrote The Secret Territory. It was in response to the war that is raging in America against our liberties. And I felt the people of America and the people of the world needed to know who was the instigator of the destruction of civil and religious liberty throughout the earth. And that's why I wrote The Secret Terrorist. The Enemy Unmasked. Once I wrote The Secret Terrorist, there were, as you can imagine, there were a lot of people that let me know that I was crazy, that I was a fool, that uh, I didn't know what I was talking about, that I had no basis for what I was saying, and that I might as well just dig a hole and jump in because I really had no purpose in this world. I mean, very cruel things. 
And a lot of people would be very intellectual with me and say, you know, they'd pat me on the back and say, you know, that was a good try, brother, but the Jews are the ones controlling the world. And then somebody else would pat this shoulder and say it's the Illuminati. And then another one would say it's the, uh, the Bilderbergers, the Communists, the Council on Foreign Relations. You know, it goes on and on and on and on. And I said, okay, fine. If they are all right, you know, that it's one of these other groups and I'm wrong, then <coughs> the history, history will show who is right. Mm -hmm. Well, I knew already that I had the greatest source of information behind what I wrote in The Secret Terrorist, and that's the Bible, and the Great Controversy. So I knew I was right. But I said, I will go back and research all these other groups to see who it is that actually controls the Jews, who it is that controls the Bilderbergers, who controls the international bankers. So I went back and researched for and the enemy unmasked was the result of that research to show that all of those groups are merely fronts that the papacy uses as puppets on a string and simply pulls their strings and says, you control the finance, you control the governments, you control the religions, and we'll sit back here and drink champagne while you guys get all the black eyes, the world will think we've changed. That's why I wrote The Enemy and Mass. Has your life been threatened because of what you've written? How do you feel about it? Yes, it has. How do I feel about it? That's not, it's none of my business. My job is not to worry about consequences. My job is to proclaim the teachings of Scripture and the Spirit of prophecy. What happens to me, that's not up to me. That's up to Him. Amen. As a dear lady in my church back home said, Bill, as long as God has work for you to do, you're immortal. <laughs> are we responsible if our families are lost? <laughs> well, Dumasani told me when I came here, he said it wasn't going to be easy. <laughs> well, Will Adam and Eve be lost because Cain will be a lost man? No. No, they won't. Will Samuel be a lost man because first, uh, I believe it's 1 Samuel chapter 9. Let me just take a look at that real quick. This, this verse has really perplexed me. Uh, but then again, it hasn't. 1 Samuel, I believe it's chapter 9. When the elders of Israel came to Samuel and said, Samuel, we want a king because you are getting old. And uh, here it is, 1 Samuel chapter 8. Notice what the Bible says. Starting with verse 1. It came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel. The name of his second, Abiah. They were judges in Beersheba. His sons walked not in his ways. Samuel was a faithful man. His boys were not. But turned aside after lucre and took bribes and perverted judgment. Mm -hmm. Then all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah and said to him, Behold, thou art old and thy sons walk not in thy ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Well, Folk, in my Bible it says, and in your Bible too, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, Samuel is in the house, in the hall of faith, isn't he? Samuel's there. But obviously in Scripture, his sons, unless they repented, they're not going to be. I believe that his parents... We have a divine responsibility to do all that we can to educate with, with kindness and with firmness the character of God to our children. Folk, 
there does then come a point in time when our children reach an age where they have to make a decision for themselves. And um, sometimes they choose to follow in what we have educated them to do. And sometimes they don't. If they choose not to, then of course we need to continue to pray earnestly that they will see their ways and come back to the truth of God. Uh, and at the same time, while they're out, if they are out, we need to do all we can as a loving parent to let that child know how special, how precious, and how, how much we love them, even though they have chosen to walk outside of what we taught them to do. So, I don't believe that any one of us will be lost if our children have chosen in themselves to be lost. Who was really responsible for the Boston bombings and why did the bombings happen? Folk, there have been, there's been terrorism from, I mean it's been happening for so long, but in the last 20 or so years, we looked at some this morning. Um, you had Waco, you had Oklahoma City, you had September 11th, and uh, now you have the Boston bombings. Now, of course, the Boston bombings were on a far smaller scale than the other three that I've mentioned. Nevertheless, folk, there, in all of them, there are elements that are the same. Number one, people die. Number two, uh, it's done so that the message is communicated Obviously here, not only just in America, but all over the world. The aftermath of the Boston bombings, which typically is how you can tell who is behind an event. Who benefited from the Boston bombings? Well, the government of Boston, the power that was granted to the local police forces and the FBI and the, and the CIA, the government officials, that were in Boston, they benefited by what happened in the Boston bombings. Now, how did they benefit? Boston was put in basically into shutdown mode, meaning there was a curfew. People had no freedom, hardly, I mean, you know, it was basically like they were in a prison compound. So who benefited by the Boston bombing? The government did. And folk, in light of what we know, in light of what we studied two nights ago, on will the real enemy please stand up, the governments of the world today, the governments of the world today are not their own. America is not its own. The, the government politicians of America do not act on their own. The English leaders do not act on their own. The Bible says in Revelation 17 that the kings of the earth are ruled over by the Roman Catholic Church. So when power is given to government through terrorism, the papacy is behind it. I believe the Boston bombings, I believe September 11, 2001, Oklahoma City, Waco, all of those leaders that were in power when those things happened, Bill Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama, they all have tithes and have shown their absolute obeisance to the Roman Catholic Church. All of them have. All those terrorist acts, and any terrorist acts that take place around the world, have been instigated and planned and executed by the Jesuit order through their puppets, 
who have sold their souls to them. You say, I didn't hear that on BBC. Who controls BBC? Who pays the paychecks of the people that tell you what happened from the BBC? Who pays their paychecks? Well, it's wealthy people. And Revelation 18, 11 to 15 tells us who controls the wealthy people of this world. Read your Bible, folks. Revelation 18, 15 says, The merchants of these things which were made rich by her. The merchants of the earth, the Catholic Church, is as one folk in this world. The papacy controls the wealthy, the wealthy control the media outlets, the BBC, CNN, the newspapers, the radios. They tell them what to say and who is behind events. It's fascinating to me that in our world today, who is always blamed, almost always blamed? Muslims. Islam. That's right. And what Islam is, is a smokescreen. The papacy uses Islam. There's the scapegoat right there. They're the evil power. They're the one that has to be destroyed. And the Catholic Church looks lily, you know, just beautiful, beautiful in front of the world. But they're a wonderful Christian church. But Islam is evil to the core. That's what you hear, isn't it? But who's telling you that, folk? It's the people that don't want you to understand that they are the ones really behind it. And if you go read Revelation 17 and 18, you will see an international conspiracy at the end of time. Papacy, the political leaders of the world, the financial people of the world, the business people, the churches of the world, using war and terrorism to destroy Protestantism in this world. That's what you'll see in Revelation 17 and 18, if you go read it. If a church leader is an apostasy, does, does that mean that the whole church and its members are also apostate? The whole church becomes apostate only if they go along with the pastor. Mm -hmm. If they stand up to the pastor and protest his errors and his false teachings, they are no longer responsible for his foolishness. But if they agree with his foolishness and they go along with his foolishness, they're just as accountable for his foolishness because now it's theirs. The U.S. advised the British to unite the European Union. Can these be the end of freedom for all the nations in controlling our lives? I am not familiar with America's involvement in telling England to unite with the European Union. Um, there are so many events, and, and this could very well be one of them, but there are so many events that take place to bring about the end of all freedom for all nations, because Rome, as you read in Revelation 17 and 18, Rome controls the governments, the political leaders of the world. So they are seeking in all nations to eliminate freedom. What is the key to overcoming sin? I think the best way to illustrate that is the story of the young lady that lived in Bethany who had made a mint as a prostitute 
in a town called Magdala. And um, she finally came home after she had invested all of her wealth in prostitution, where she had bought a box of ointment. And she brought that box and she came home to Bethany. And one day there were 13 hungry, tired men that came into her home, her sister and her brother's home in Bethany. And uh, when her sister Martha saw these 13 hungry, tired men come into her home, Martha headed to the kitchen, which is where every um, woman typically will go when hungry men walk into their house. Is that not true? Yeah. It is true. Okay. I know in the Middle East, uh, if I hadn't have told them before I went there that um, I didn't, I would only eat three or, you know, two, sometimes three times in a day. Um, if I hadn't have done that, folk, I would have gained a hundred pounds in Egypt. <laughs> because wherever you go, wherever you go, as soon as you walk into their house, the wife heads to the kitchen and makes you a three-course meal. So, but my wife made it clear ahead of time, so I was okay. Mary, when Martha headed to the kitchen, where, what did Mary do? Mary stayed and listened at the feet of Jesus, listened to his teachings. Well, to overcome sin, the only way we can is the same way that Christ did. Christ said, it is written. We spend time in prayer in the morning. You don't do it at night after the day's over and the devil's assaulted us all day long. You do it in the morning before the battle begins. Then as you go out to meet your day, you've, you've prayed. And you put some uh, Bible verses to memory. They like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. For my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. So we fill our minds with, with promises. The Bible calls them the sword of the spirit. We go out to meet our day. The devil assaults us. When he assaults us, we say, it is written. We claim the power of the word of God. And in claiming that power by faith in Christ, we admit our weakness. We tell him we're depending upon him for strength. And then we thank him for victory. We thank him for helping us overcome. We just overcome, folks, that sin, for that, that temptation for that moment. Next one comes, you do the same thing. Same thing. Dumasani, I don't see very well with, without my glasses on. Did you give me the cutoff time? Is I it did. time to stop? Yeah, I had to say it, yeah, but I did, yeah. What's that? Yes. Okay, um, okay. The last question, we go a little bit further, I'd be happy to answer, it's on the first and second covenant. Basically the first covenant was um, the children of Israel said, we will do exactly what God said. That was the first covenant, it was obey and live. But that was not God's intent. The second covenant was that the only way to obedience to God's law is through faith in Jesus Christ. That was God's covenant, the everlasting covenant that he wanted people to believe all along. But the children of Israel thought they could keep God's commandments by themselves. That's the difference in the two covenants. Um, like I said, there's others here, but we need to stop. So... Um, if your question wasn't answered, if you'd like to uh, speak to me after.